88. <laughs> All right. It's okay. five o'clock. Are time. we ready? Okay. I think we're ready. So we, well, it's wind down Wednesday, right? Okay, so we wind to, down Wednesday. We have to start with a virtual toast. Oh, there to Richard Q, Mark, <laughs> Katie, everyone, Chin -chin. all of our friends around the world. Here's everybody. <laughs> so nice to have everybody join us tonight. We're really privileged to um, have Dr. Margaret Bowman um, uh, join us this evening for our conversation. Um, we've known Dr. Bowman for quite a long time. Uh, I, I don't know, I mean, there's so much that we could say about you. you. You were a pioneer in research in autism and a supporter of occupational therapy and sensory integration from decades ago and I'm so impressed because you have continued your research and practice so you've kept one foot in practice and one foot in research all these many years I don't know Zoe if you have yeah I mean I think you know we always felt like there was some parallels to your uh, career and Dr. Ayer she was also someone who tried to stay equally involved in research and in clinical practice and it's so impressive. I think that's such an unusual way to go about, you know, a, um, having a career to be able to do both and do both things so exquisitely the way that you have. I just every time we hear parents talk about you, about Dr. B, and how warm and uh, compassionate you are with them, with their families and children, it, it's it's just really heartwarming. So. We want to thank you for everything you've done on both ends, on the research end and on the clinical end. You've been just done such amazing things for children and families. So you know we got a lot of questions. Suzanne, I'll maybe let you get started because I think you well, Dr. Bowman, I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit about your background before we get into the questions. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yes, I've had my feet in both camps if, to start with. I, I think that part of the story is that as a, as a child neurologist, I was never trained to know anything about speech and language or occupational therapy or any of those other things where you're trained as a neurologist and you're trained to think about seizures and you're trained to think of, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Perfect. Uh, <laughs> headaches and other kinds of things. But, you know, the concept that there are other disciplines that may somehow contribute to your knowledge really isn't something that most of us are trained in. And this was, my training came through the era when the Kennedy, John F. Kennedy the, was back in the dark ages, I'll really date myself, uh, but they had started these things that were called university affiliated programs, UAPs, in various sites throughout the country. And my recall is that they were designed in large part to evaluate people in the institutions to get them back out into the, into the real world. That was the gist. And there were these multidisciplinary teams. And I was assigned to one of these teams out of, outside of, uh, from Mass General. And it was the first time that I think that I had a chance to sit at a table or sit in a clinic with OT, PT, speech and language, psychology, social work, audiology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, education, uh, where we were all looking at the same patient. And it was a tremendous educational program for me when I, it really allowed me, I think, to have a better understanding of different systems, which we were never taught. So it was an unusual situation. And then I think I got into the, the researchy part largely because I was sort of forced to, frankly, uh, that was a sign that I had to spend six months doing research. And I met a research colleague and we got into the autism story and that was just kind of a lot of things just sort of happened as a fluke. And then I kind of kept that way because my first agenda was, well, if I don't get a grant, at least I can still see patients. And if my patients don't like me, then maybe I can go back and do research. So I was kind of balancing <laughs> things to kind of sort of protect myself. Uh, but on the other hand, what ended up happening was, which you've already suggested, is that the clinical side of this story really allows you to ask questions of your research and your research forces you to ask questions about what's going on in the clinic. So it's really, a, a, for me, it's always been a very good balance. And I, I'm i very grateful that I've had the opportunity and I've had some very good mentors who have supported me to do that. So it is, it's an unusual story, I will grant you. But I think it's been a valuable one. 
You know, Margaret, we don't have this on our list, but just listening to you and knowing that now we have over 100 people in the room with us, and even though we have Marco here, probably most of the people in the room are women. I wow. just, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about what that was like, you know, to be a, uh, to be a woman at that time trying to do research. You were also a mom trying to raise that. your kids. Mm -hmm. and. Well, I mean, especially now with everybody at home trying to even, you know, juggle things even more than we usually do. I wonder if you mind well, touching it on wasn't, that. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I was okay through medical school. I, uh, when I did, was an intern, apparently the place that I went did my internship, which was the University of Maryland, they, whoever was on the committee sort of made a mistake in terms of how they allotted all of us interns to have be on different services and they freaked out one time when they discovered that they had put three women in the emergency room and no men um that they because they were they didn't think that women could really handle the emergency room all by themselves apparently so that was a little bit of a freak out um and then i you know one of my my hospital appointments was such that uh, being being a female was not popular. You were, they, it's still probably not popular. But it, uh, you know, I was basically told that I didn't need to make any money because I was married. I couldn't be serious about my career because I had children. Um, I was, it, it was that kind of feeling. And I think I got farmed out, um, maybe because they, I was female and they didn't really care where I was. Uh, and frankly, that turned out to be a benefit for me because when I was farmed out off the main campus, um, I could do anything I <laughs> well please. And uh, so it, it allowed me to have the freedom to develop programs, which is how they, what we then called the Ladders Program, which was a, an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary clinic where you know we all learn from each other, we all sell these, these kids together and so forth. That was not something that was going on in, this, in the main campus at all. And it just, it, you know, it just happened because I had the freedom to just do what I wanted to do. Uh, so there were a lot of advantages to it. There were also some, you know, I'm not a particularly political animal. Uh, so, you know, I don't do politics very well. So that was probably a downside, I guess. Um, but on the other hand, having the freedom to do what I wanted to do was a real plus. In terms of the having kids and a husband, I remember when I was a medical student, I was told in order to be a success, you had to have an understanding of a husband and good household help. <laughs> so uh, we fortunately had a nanny uh, who was, uh, really became, she was with us for 17 years. Oh, right. uh, yeah, and uh, really be, sort of became the, the third grandmother. And I had a wonderful husband who was a radiologist who, I guess, I told his siblings that he was never going to marry anybody who went to medical school. Somehow he got trapped, I guess. Uh, but it was a great support. Uh, so I don't know. I was, I was just lucky, I guess, is the best way to say it. But I really have learned a lot from the interaction that I've had from other people. And I, particularly for the world of autism, I think that this is, it was complicated when I got started on it. And it's gotten increasingly more complicated. These kids are complex. It's heterogeneous. And to think that this is just a brain problem is just not even cutting the surface. I mean, this is just, yes, it uh, largely involves the brain, but there are it's, multiple organ systems are involved in this, there are multiple issues. And it, every time you go to some conference and hear these stories or get somebody presents a, 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 a presentation that says, well, we found 100 candidate genes for autism. I'm sitting there saying, yeah, so what do you want me to do with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, they're, I, I don't know how much you want me to get into this, but one of, one of my well, big... Well, go for it. Um, this... All right. Well, one of my big complaints, I guess, and I don't know that it's a complaint, it's, it's something that I like to see change, is that when people are doing genetics, when they're doing imaging, when we're doing post-mortem brain work, we don't really have a lot of data on the subjects that we're evaluating, which is a huge problem. Right, right because it's so heterogeneous and so the general thought is that if you just diagnose somebody as meeting criteria for autism spectrum disorder be it on the ADOS or the ADIR or whatever it is that you're using that's not enough that's not enough 
I mean, if I have a postmortem brain or two or three of somebody in their 30s, I want to know what were they like when they were two? What, were they, you know, what was their developmental trajectory? Uh, what kind of behaviors did they have? Uh, what happened when they were 10? Blah, 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 blah. And that data just isn't there. And I think a lot of the difficulties that we in science are struggling with here is that many of us are studying different populations. We haven't really defined the population group very well. Uh, so that somebody can do, you know, uh, do a postmortem study on 10 brains on the, you know, from Minnesota or something. And we could have ours and somebody else could do something in California. And we might all have somewhat different results. Does that mean one of us is wrong and one of us is right? I don't think that's what that means at all. I think it means we're looking at different groups of people. And we haven't been able to define subgroups very well, which I know there's a big push for right now, which I fully support. Mm -hmm. The question is, how are you going to define the subgroups? Are you going to define them based on their um, medical history? Or are you going to define them on the basis of their clinical presentation? Are you going to define them on the basis of some kind of genetic something or other? I, I don't know that we really have a good handle on how we're going to define these subgroups, but I think somehow we need to start putting groups of people together in order to get our heads wrapped around this because it's, it's so complex. I, you know, there are the kids that have gastrointestinal problems, for example. Is that a subgroup? Is that part of a subgroup? What's, what, is that, what is that telling? What about the kids with metabolic disorders, mitochondrial disorders? Well, is that a subgroup? I don't know. It may be just part of a subgroup. And then, you know, I think that you guys are all interested in the sensory processing disorder. And I'm pretty convinced that almost all of them have sensory processing problems in one form or another at this point, frankly. Uh, yeah, so our research would have said that everybody that I tested when we reported on 89, but everybody had rather severe yeah. sensory integration and praxis deficit in that um, cohort. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And I, but even within, I mean, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about that, but my perception is even within that cohort, there's a lot of variability. I mean, some are sensory seekers, some are sensory avoiders, some are both. And, you know, it, it, it's really an incredible array of stuff. Uh, and, I, you know, how do you begin to break this down into something that we can all wrap our head around is, is really a challenge. It's a huge challenge. So anyway. Yeah. Well, we were also discussing earlier when, when Zoe and I were preparing for this, and she's going, she's trying to rejoin us um, with uh, trying to get back on Wi-Fi. But we were um, we were talking about the differences in age groups yeah. and what you know is there a difference in you know what we can expect in children versus adults? And I know you had mentioned male versus female. Are you finding differences? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, the age groups. I think that, um, yes, I think the kids, first of all, most of the diagnostic measures that we have are designed for children. So you mm -hmm. cannot do it, you know, really can't really do a successful ADOS on an 89 year old person, <laughs> okay? Because we're not talking about play skills, uh, you know, we're not, right. we're not talking about the kind of things that, that one would do with a two year old or a four year old. So we really don't have good measures for the aging population. And, this, I'm going off topic here a little bit, but I've become very interested in the aging um, Well, I'm interested too, because I have a brother with fragile X syndrome who is almost 60. Yep. With, now he has a diagnosis of autism. He didn't then, but, uh, but he's in isolation and it, we're trying to figure out what are we going to do? You know, how do we get enrichment for him yep. in situation yep. on lockdown? Right. No, that's a challenge for sure no but i think that the kids kids do look different and it, you know i've followed a lot of these kids since they were young i'm again will age myself here but i mean a lot of them are now college students and, and you know trying to decide what they want to be and even have people in their 40s and, 40s and they really are different when they're old Either they've learned to compensate for them or they've come up with their own methods or whatever it is, uh, but they do better. I'm also seeing less self, uh, self uh, repetitive behaviors, I guess, in, in the adults. I don't see that as, as much uh, in the adults. Uh, they are able to do certain tasks, maybe it's because they've been well trained, I don't know, but um, they really are, are pretty good at what they do. And I, 
I'm very impressed by a lot of my, my patients about how well a lot of them have, have turned out. I'm, I'm just amazed at how well they've turned out. Um, and I, I, I think that you raised early on a question about some of the postmortem brains. And yes, we did see differences in the kids that were under the age of, I think it was 12 or 13. Those brains looked different than the teenage brains. We were not doing a lot with the ones over the age of 21, so I can't really get, get into that too much. But there were some, some structural differences in terms of the sizes of neurons and how many neurons there were and so forth. So things are really changing uh, throughout the lifespan of these kids, which is sort of why I'm, I've gotten very interested in the adults um, and, the, you know, frankly, the aging population. First of all, the real question is where the heck are the aging ones? Because this is a disorder that's been really geared more to children and nobody's really thought about the fact that children get older and you know what the heck happened to them. And I think you know that a lot of them got misdiagnosed with other things like mental retardation or some kind of psychiatric problem or something of that sort. So yeah. how do we go back and try to find out where they are and we don't, as I just said earlier, have really have any good diagnostic measures to say whether they are or they aren't. I think we can use what we have, but we're not really good at it. And then that gets me to the male-female story, which has really gotten to be a very fascinating story in my view. And I think they're absolutely right. There's a sense that women, females have been underdiagnosed, and I think that's correct. Um, you know, I don't think we have a really good sense about what their numbers may be, but they do present differently. And I had an interesting story of a 34-year-old lady who came in, who's married, who has a little boy. And she, and actually he's, I think he, what he really has is a sensory processing disorder, by the way. Oh, okay. um, and, and I think she's got the same thing. And so what happened was that she still saw many of the symptoms of her son. And so she, and she had just, at the age of 34, had just been diagnosed with autism, by the way. And so she came to me to determine whether her son also had autism. And I looked at him and I wasn't sure he had autism at all. I think he's got a sensory processing disorder. So frankly, I sent them both to get an evaluation because- oh, That's um, great. But, but anyway, she made the comment that she remembered when she was younger, that she would try very hard to figure out what the other girls were doing and try to mimic them. And I think that's sort of what's happening, that the girls, that my perception, the girls don't have as much of the repetitive behaviors that boys have. So they don't stand out quite so much. They kind of figure out how to get by. They kind of just, um, they, 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 they don't just kind of sit there. They just kind of mimic other people and kind of try to figure it out, I guess. And they're pretty successful. Many of them are pretty successful at it. And I, again, had a 15-year-old girl who showed up in my office probably a month ago. And um, she, she's been called um, anxiety and OCD and bipolar and I don't know, whatever, anyway. So her mother was there and they were for an evaluation. And, I, you know, two minutes. And I said, I'm sorry, but I think your daughter's got an Asperger's syndrome. She's classic. I mean, it's just classic. Uh, and part of the problem was that now it's, it's, the school didn't believe me. Uh, so... Um, I had to send her to a neuropsychologist to get some formalized testing to prove that I was right. And it turns out I am right. Um, but, you know, they, they were reluctant because she's bright. She's a very intelligent young lady. And so if you're intelligent and you're a lady, but you're a little quirky, or they call her weird, I guess, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just quirky, I guess. And I, I don't think that's doing any of these kids a favor. So I do think that there is a difference in boys and girls. But again, we do not really have, a, the ADOS and the ADIR are not designed for girls. They are more designed for boys. And I think part of that comes from the fact that when Leo Cantor first designed, described his, his original studies, they were all boys. And I don't know that people have really tuned into the whole issue of females, but I think it's an interesting story that I hope we'll, we'll, we can expand on it as time goes by, because I think it's a, an interesting group of kids, and uh, they're interesting. They are very, a lot of them are really bright, but they are unusual, I guess, uh -huh. to describe it. So I, I, I hope that kind of research expands, but they certainly have sensory processing problems as well. There's just no question about it. And I think the, the other thing that I've learned recently, because I was asked to write a chapter about anxiety, you, you need to tell me when to shut up. Okay? No, 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 no. Yeah, well, six o'clock. It's <laughs> not before then. Uh -huh. not before. I to write it. Somebody asked me to write a chapter on anxiety. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, okay? I'm just a neurologist. So I had to do a lot of reading. 
And it really occurred to me, which you guys probably know far better than I do, that a lot of these, these kids really are anxious because of their sensory processing disorders. So that they, they don't like the unexpected at all. Well, you know, that as long as is, you have know, got their routine, they know what to expect, nobody's going to touch them, nobody's going to, you know, make noises or whatever it is, uh, they're okay. But boy, if it's a new environment, particularly any kind of group or something, we got a problem. Uh, and I, I really, I was very impressed having done a lot of the reading, made me go back and really think about some of the kids that I'd seen. I'd be curious to hear what you guys have to say and hear what your impressions are vis-a-vis -vis anxiety as it relates to sensory processing disorder. Give me some clues. Well, in my experience, uh, the kids have such a difficult time decoding information. They barely know what their bodies are doing, and then they have to simultaneously process the world. Mm -hmm. We think they do better with the familiar world, like, you know, their parents, the, their home. They do better because that's, that it's easier to, you know, process that data because it's not as changing. But as soon as they get into variability, the processing load is exponentially higher, and then they have to figure out what to do with it, which we're calling praxis, that imitation mm -hmm. piece is part of that. And then that's really anxiety provoking for them because they kind of know what to do. So if they stay in their lane, yeah. they can look quite proficient, but if they get out of that avenue of proficiency or familiarity, they, they're not accessing, generalizing, mm -hmm. creating new ma action plans. Yeah. Uh, and that's real hard and it takes more time. You think that's why that they do better with older kids or older adults because uh, they're more predictable, whereas a young child is not as predictable. You think that's right? I, that, that's my guess. Yeah. More predictable and probably more supportive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's true for sure. I totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah make accommodate a little bit more. Right. Well, you know, but, I'm sorry, just to uh, jump on that what Suzanne was saying, and you know, it's been coming to mind a lot, Margaret, as we've done the Nancy um, Lori Marks group that the researchers in autism outside of OT have have largely, I think, now become aware of the problems in sensory what work what you know is now called sensory reactivity mm -hmm. the over and under yeah. responses to sensation but i think we have a long way to go in in the understanding of perception of the mm -hmm. basic senses tactile perception proprioception the vestibular sense i would love it if we have time if you could talk a little bit about the vestibular sense and the cerebellum mm -hmm. i know i've heard you say some amazing things around that that i think are very interesting to occupational therapists but that area of sensory perception, and like Suzanne is saying, the praxis seems so far, you know, so far from um, being understood. I totally agree. And when we get back, when we talk about anxiety, there's so much anxiety when you don't know what to do. You mm -hmm. don't know how to get started, how to initiate, how to plan, um, yep. and, and just knowing where your body is and, and where you are in space. I, I think mm -hmm. we have a lot of work to do to help increase understanding on those realms too. Well, I think that part of the problem is that most of those people have not been trained to even think along those lines, frankly. Uh, it's not that they're, they haven't or couldn't. I just it don't think it's been part of their training. And I think we have done a very bad job of training medical students or graduate students or whoever they are to think more broadly. I think we, 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 when, I was, when we had the ladders program, this multidisciplinary program, uh, we the, the pediatric residents from the Mass General Hospital spent one day out of their entire three-year training in this clinic, okay? We got the psychiatrist for three months. We never saw any of the adult neurology people ever. And I just don't think, you know, given the prevalence rate of this disorder, that is a real disservice to people who are going to have to be dealing with these people in one form or another. Uh, you know, they, if we really believe that the prevalence rate is to be one in 59, you know, these kids are going to get big and they're going to be in somebody's practice. And uh, we're not doing a very good a job of training people, I don't think. One, one of the clinical concerns that has given us referrals at our clinic here in Irvine is 
actually social isolation. So we might have these um, pretty capable teenagers and adults, yep. young adults who have had reasonably good support through school and then they get even maybe through college mm -hmm. and then they don't want to leave the house. Yep. So one of the, you know, I guess one of the questions that I have is, you know, about this pandemic and what we're doing in terms of the physical distancing with this pandemic, but I have concerns that are they really not going to want to leave the house when the pandemic's over, that, that they're going to habituate to this isolating kind of condition, but it isn't, you know, over time, we know that, it, I mean, we can maybe go take a walk and we can do these webinars, but if they don't have strategies that keep them physically healthy and socially engaged, I, I have concerns about this. I don't know if you've thought of that. That's a very interesting question. And frankly, I think you guys should do a study. I mean, I'm not kidding. Yeah, seriously. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I mean, get a graduate, yeah. two or three. But because I think that is a very interesting question. I mean, really, um, that would be truly fascinating. I think that's an excellent question. Yeah, because two, two young adults, and they were both women, um, just refused to leave the house for a year until the parents were tearing their hair out and said, you know, this can't go on. We're, you know, this, we, we and the, well, we can't pick them up. We can't move them out. We slowly did. We, we you know, what the, the treatment was to um, have them slowly engage with a very trusted therapist in doing stuff like yoga, but in a very private clinic setting, and then slowly, slowly go into the community, slowly, slowly do those activities, like taking a walk that was very protected and going out, but um, anyway, but it, it was slow in terms of progress. Yeah, but my hunch is you're gonna have to start over again. Right. I'm afraid. And you know that's this is that's a really good point, uh, both of you, to think about for this for the telehealth modules that we're working on to just plant that early to be thinking about you know not getting so set in a routine at mm -hmm. home that yeah. it can't be broken. That's something we probably need to really be supporting families because they're you know just trying to get through the days. They're probably doing whatever it takes with screens and whatever to survive the situation, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe in some of this work we're doing on the support during this time, we have to think early about getting ready to break out of that mode. I think that's a great idea, actually. That's mm -hmm. very good. And I hadn't even thought of that before, but I think your, your point's well taken. Yeah. So, have you had some success with telehealth? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Um, success with telehealth. I don't, I don't, it's functional. I wouldn't say it's been great. Uh, mm -hmm. I really, I really like having the kids in the office, frankly. And um, mostly when it's doing telehealth, I'm really spending most of the time talking to the parents and rather than spending time with the kids. So I don't know that from my perspective, I think we're just kind of holding the fort, uh, just trying to deal with the sort of superficial stuff. I don't think we're, I think you guys are in a much better position to do that than, than those of us who are physicians, frankly. I'm not begging the begging off here, but I just, you know, most of it is listening to the parents about and trying to help them come up with some strategies, but we're not really not really seeing the kids. I mean, they, they kind of wander around while, you know, or jumping up and down or something in the background, but you're not really seeing the kids very well. So it, it, it's, um, it's, it's, it's more challenging, I think, from some respects. Mm -hmm. Most, and most of the ones I was like I was telling you about somebody who's who's being sequestered because they're on a 14-day quarantine and they can't get out. Uh, you know, at least there's some of the 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 parents who have younger children. And as weird as this may sound, sound like they're doing a little bit better because many of them have fenced-in backyards and they've got places where the kids can run around and play. Uh, the ones that I think are a little more challenging are people who have teenagers, and I think that that's much more challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the teenagers have some significant behavior problems that are hard for parents to deal with and you know you're, they're physically bigger so they're harder to deal with so I, I think that's that's a real challenge. But I like your idea of doing this telehealth thing 
And I think that, that the, the point that Zoe raised, I think, is a very good one. Yeah. Well, sorry I got lost there for a while. Wi-Fi went out. Um, so where are you on their question, Suzanne? You know, you, number five, I think, was a great question from you, Zoe, mm. about different symptoms. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, uh, Margaret, you've been such an amazing advocate for helping us in the therapy field to be aware of medical and dental issues and, you know, other issues that go unseen or misinterpreted with people with autism. We've appreciated that guidance from you so much. And I was just wondering if there's anything about this virus and either symptom, symptomatology or the prevention that anything you, you know, have on, have in your mind to share with therapists to be thinking about, do you think that there are, I mean, you know, fortunately it doesn't seem to be affecting the younger children so much, but you know, an older person with, with autism who might come in contact with the virus, do you think there's anything we need to be looking for? Um, I, you know, I don't know what this virus is going to look like in older, fortunately I have not been exposed to anybody. <laughs> so, um, lucky. I, yeah, very trying very hard not well, to be. keep it that way. Stay yeah. safe. <laughs> yeah, we need you. <laughs> the best I can. Um, I don't know what this will look like. I just think that people have to be very conscious of any change in any change in behavior that somebody comes up with mm -hmm. who's on the spectrum, particularly if the kids are not kids, children, adolescents, adults are nonverbal. They are not going to be able to tell you anything about what's going on. And so I think it's still the the same theme is any change in behavior merits a really careful look for some kind of medical component here. Uh, you know, we're talking about coughing. I talked about, you know, we've got a couple of kids that had sniffles and do they have a fever? I mean, those are supposed to be the hallmark, I guess, shortness of breath. I haven't seen any so far, uh, somebody come in with shortness of breath or heard about it yet. And I think a lot of the, the schools, we have a lot of private schools out here. So a lot of those schools closed down pretty quickly and sent their kids home. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, group homes. Group homes may be challenging, and I think that is a really tough question. I don't know, I haven't heard any vibes back yet from the group homes, but even out here, our group homes are not that big. Maybe there are three or four clients that are in a group home. There's not more than that. So we're not talking about homes that are sort of for senior citizens who are these large conglomerate things. So even if there were some kind of an outbreak in a, a group home, it, I don't think it's going to go very far, personally. But I don't know. I haven't heard anything. Have you, you guys heard anything about group homes? Well, my experience is, again, with my brother. He's with four, he's one of four residents, and they've shut everything as tight as a drum, and they're cleaning, they're, they're extremely uh, conscientious. We can't come. We couldn't. We couldn't come and exchange. He couldn't come out to the car. So we're just FaceTiming, but they've been very, here in California. Now, hopefully that's true everywhere. But, I, but let, Margaret, if you don't mind, I wanna go back to what you were saying about behavior. Because uh -huh. I, I think, you know, when you, you came and did an amazing presentation for us and you showed us videos, and there were four very different videos, and one looked like a seizure, and one looked like behavior, and one looked like self-stim, and it was all like gastrointestinal problems. So, so I, I think that's something really on my mind, that something that could be misinterpreted as mm -hmm. just being grouchy or having a bad day could actually be reflective of a of a bigger concern i don't know how everybody's nutrition is during i know it really throws off your routine in terms of getting the right nutrition and exercise but and sleep <laughs> sleep sleep's thrown off yeah so so i think you know from a compassionate standpoint uh not to to be too quick to interpret some, you know, some kind of difference in behavior as a negative behavior or, or just autism, but it could be symptomatic of yeah. not feeling good in some way. No, I would and totally agree with that. Even as, as basic as temperature, do you have, like, how would you, how do you take temperature when you're 
uh, seeing a patient. You're now using those ones where you just come out on your face. Uh -huh. You know, so you don't have to put it under your tongue or do anything dramatic uh -huh. like that. And most of the time you can get away with that. Uh, but other than that, I, otherwise it's challenging. You hope they don't bite off the thermometer. Uh, you know, but you know, <laughs> they, have, <laughs> they have the kind that you can just kind of go around the face with. Uh -huh. that's, that's really we've, we've tried to buy a couple and I ordered them a month ago. They're not showing up, so they're sold out right now, but maybe somebody has a connection. Yeah, it's like toilet paper, right? You can't find it. <laughs> That's right. Toilet paper, paper towel. <laughs> and gel. Yeah, but it, I think just to, you know, for the therapist to remind, to remind the therapist, to remind the p families to be checking for fever any way they can, even if it's just a hand to the head. Yeah, you no, know, I they, mm -hmm. But I, I would also say if there's, yes, I can understand why there might be some change in behavior because the routine has been changed. I get that. Uh, but I think a lot of, uh, of the kids, you know, you can sort of tell that sometimes weak kids, they're a little bit different than they are during the week because mm -hmm. they don't have the routine of the school program and what have you. But, you know, anything that really looks like it's gone off the walls and it's totally different, that deserves a medical workup. And yeah. if you don't need to have any specific diagnosis. It could be a dental problem. It could be, you know, tummy problem, whatever it is. Uh, but if somebody needs to see this kid. And I, I you know, hope that most of the physicians out your way are familiar with kids on the spectrum and will take these families seriously. But that's one of the things that I worry about is that, that you know, if, if because, because the kids can't talk, there's still this sense about, well, you know, he's, he's, he or she is autistic, so this is just kind of an autistic behavior. And that's, that, that's not should be what's going on. It, it, needs, to be, it needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. so and, we, have, yeah. we, have, we have people here from all over the world, so I'm sure they're dealing with well, a pretty wide variety of awareness. And well, I think that you know, if you're a parent or if you're a therapist, then you need to be a pushy person and basically say, okay, you know, I understand that this child's autistic. I understand that, you know, they can have behaviorals that are a little bit different, but this is different than, than what we're typically going to see. And he, he or she needs a workup, you know, yeah. and just be pleasantly pushy. Dr. Bauman, we are getting some questions from our participants. Um, okay. And there's one that got here right now uh, that says, how do you view the use of vitamin D and probiotics? And we're talking about these medical conditions. Do you want to share your thoughts about okay. Well, first of all, most of the probiotics are used by gastroenterologists. And since I work in a team situation, I'm probably not the guru on probiotics. I think everybody is very interested in vitamin D and not necessarily just for the autism population. But I think that there's a great sense that most of us, many of us are low in vitamin D. Uh, do I think that this is gonna change somebody's life dramatically? Probably not. Uh, but I certainly think that kids should be evaluated for the vitamin D. If you're getting laboratory studies for any particular reason, I always throw in a vitamin D level. Uh, just to have it checked out. And I would say that probably, I don't know, uh, a third to a half of them certainly have low vitamin D and we give supplemental vitamin D. Uh, and uh, I just think they're probably healthier because of it, but I don't know that it's, I've seen any sort of dramatic change in behaviors or the developmental trajectory because of the vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we had another question. Um, kind of getting more uh, backing into your uh, research and clinical experience. And we wondered if there was anything that has coming, that they've discovered about autism recently that's influenced the interpretation of your previous findings. Is there anything new out there that's made you <laughs> update uh, your thinking or? Not well. Well, I guess I guess what's updated my thinking, and I had sort of alluded to this earlier, is the the issue about the cerebellum. Um, okay, she's going to talk about. The yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can yeah. have the whole rest of time on the cerebellum. <laughs> okay, let's just start there. Okay, I don't have to solve. I'm solve the problem. Well, what was interesting when we first did our work. And we found these abnormalities in the cerebellum. We were pretty much 
uh, told by the powers that be that this was clearly a mistake, uh, that this, you know, this was just some kind of weird variant or something. And, you know, because after all, these kids didn't walk around like they were drunk. And that was sort of the concept at the time was that mm -hmm. if you had anything wrong with your cerebellum, you had these, you walked around like you were drunk half the time. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and they clearly don't do that. And at that time, we all also thought they had reasonably good motor skills, which of course, we now know differently about They Many of them do not have good motor skills. But in any case, what was interesting was that at the Society for Neuroscience back in November of this last year in 2000. 19 uh, in Chicago, a presentation was given by uh, Dr. Jeremy Schmaman, S-C-H-M-A-H-M-A-N-N, -N, who is an adult neurologist at Mass General Hospital and who was a, a for, sort of a former colleague, frankly. And I went to hear his talk because it was Jeremy and I wanted to hear his talk. And, he, and he's always been interested in the cerebellum. And I really want to get back down, try to get, I'm trying to hook him a little bit more. Anyway, long story short, they clearly have found out that the cerebellum probably is playing a huge role in lots of things, but certainly in the autism world. The other person doing this work is a guy by the name of Peter Sai, spelled T-S-A-I, at uh, UT Southwestern in Texas. And he is also doing a lot of work. And same sort of story, he and, he and Jeremy are sort of colleagues, so that's probably where they're spinning off of each other. Uh, but the sense is that the cerebellum is probably guiding a lot more of the motor and even beyond that, uh, potentially sensory and other kinds of, of factors for the rest of the brain because of the connectivity, that it's, it's not this sort of just kind of hanging in there at the end of back of the brain. It's probably playing a really major role. And what was striking from Jeremy's talk, and this gets me to another area that has probably nothing to do with you guys, um, but Jeremy related about a patient who had, I don't remember the story exactly, but whoever it was, was having a lot of trouble with language and various other kinds of things going on at the time. And I think at that time they were using uh, trans, transcranial magnetic um, treatments, and, but to the cerebellum and specifically. And apparently several weeks after they started this, this person began to talk and started to have get improvements because of whatever it is that they did in this. I realize this is not very detailed and not very scientific, but it was, I think it's probably been written up somewhere. Hey, and, it's wind down Wednesday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're in our happy place now. This is like, <laughs> I look up anything by Peter Sy or uh, Jeremy Schmaman. But anyway, so at the end of his talk, I went to Jeremy and I said, Jeremy, I need to talk to you because one of my big things is why do we have reasonably intelligent nonverbal autistic people that don't talk why are these people not talking you can put them on a computer you put them on a laptop they're typing up all kinds of stuff they're clearly not stupid they're getting a lot of stuff where's the block and i you know and the fact that he'd done this on the cerebellum and this other client talked about started to talk i said you know what i would really like to do a study with you to do get some of my uh, you know adults in there who aren't talking to see if we could do something with this and i haven't been able to corral him but i think that this is a huge wouldn't that be cool if if that were really i don't know what it what where the breakdown is but there's something there that's keeping these people from talking and the other thing that you've probably seen as much as I have is that occasionally you get one of these nonverbal persons. And a good story of this is a guy who was in his 30s at the time who had a fear of dogs. And he's out with his father in the car, and it's summertime, and they've got the window rolled down, and there's a parking lot. And this big dog comes bounding across the parking lot, jumps up on the side of the car, and this guy blurts out, Tell Mr. So and so to shut the window. Tell Mr. Brown to shut the window. I mean, it never says anything, I hadn't said anything before that, but this perfectly intelligent sentence comes out. And so it's not like they can't, at least under some circumstances, but it has to be something apparently that really pushes, gets their adrenaline going or something's going that finally gets them to say whatever it is that they're gonna say. And it's perfectly intelligent and it's said well, and it makes good sense, and then they don't say anything more. And where's the breakdown? 
I thought I would, I mean, I don't know whether it's coming from the cerebellum, but Jeremy really, really pushed my buttons. And I really think that there probably is something in the cerebellum that we really need to go after. And I would urge people, if they're interested in the cerebellum, to really get after these two guys, because they're the ones that are really leading the charge uh, from a research perspective. And to my knowledge, there's not a lot of other research going on in the cerebellum. People really have kind of ignored it, uh, at least in the autism field. There's a lot of research about the hippocampus and the limbic system. Certainly those are players for sure. Uh, but boy, I, I don't know. I think that there's, there's a piece of the story that's much more broad that we have yet to even, even begin to look at. And so I, I, I don't have the answers, but I would encourage anybody who's interested in research to think seriously about looking at something. And certainly not, if it's not, you know, why don't they speak, which is my big hang up. Maybe you've got another, another thing you'd like to look at, but boy, I'd really go after that cerebellum. We'll see if we, maybe we can, um, I'm sure they've published, maybe we can get some of their papers and share them with I our wish group. I think Jeremy actually has not published this story on this, okay. this woman that he described at the meeting. Uh, I think because he's kind of afraid to. <laughs> uh, I, I, I sensed a kind of reluctance that I don't know whether he thought that he, if he published it, it would get in over his head. I don't, I'm not sure, but I, I don't think he's published that particular person. But he certainly has published a lot of things on the cerebellum, and I, he's, he's well worth reading. He's a good guy, and he's smart as heck, and I, I think if you want to know anything about the cerebellum, he, he or Peter Sy would be the right people. And Richard just uh, spelled the names of these two doctors on the, on the chat box. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we can find them. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. D did you get to talk about the age difference in Suzanne while I was away? A little bit. Yeah. Well, a little bit. She kind of addressed that. Okay. Okay. But you know, if we just don't leave the cerebellum too quickly, because <laughs> <laughs> one no, of nobody uh, wants to. Hypotheses that Dr. Ayers had was that there was a link between the brain stem and cerebellum that was very um, important in sensory integration and, and that link between sensory and motor function, you know, at that level of the brain. And she felt particularly the vestibular system, when the vestibular system wasn't well integrated, that you saw the consequence as a lack of realization of the specialization in the higher neocortical areas. So she said it was like a block to potential. And that if we could somehow activate that brainstem cerebellar system through sensory motor enrichment, engagement, therapeutic activities, that sometimes it was like you turn the lights on. And I'm not sure that we've, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I've seen that in particular with autism. I've seen it with kids that don't have any other diagnoses that have a vestibular problem where suddenly they're doing all kinds of things and speaking well. But it, but I don't know, what do you think about that, that I idea? Think, I think she might be right on the money. Uh, I did not know that she'd done that much thinking about it. I knew that you know, some of her work, but not a lot of it. And she may be right on the money. Um, I mean, particularly if, um, you know, this story I just told you, unfortunately, in a very sketchy form, is correct. It sort of fits with what you're saying. You know, that he, they did some electrical stimulation. I mean, it's not what you guys are doing, it's doing something else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. some changes were made as a result of that. So that would not surprise me. That would not surprise me. So well, she might be. She went, she had a name for it, but she's talking about interhemispheral communication at the level of the brainstem. Okay. That, that that was something that had to get going for mm -hmm. the higher level lateralization at the mm -hmm. you know neocortex. Yeah. No, it was pretty controversial at the time when she proposed it because it was in the 19 when was it in the 1970s, 1980s, mm -hmm. early 1980s? Yeah. Well, I think that that's uh, that's still a very understudied area, no question. I, mm -hmm. I think it's there are very few people that I'm aware of who in the are in the autism field who are really looking at that. You know, if you go, look at a lot of your imaging studies, you look at people who 
are doing uh, other kinds of work in mouse models or whatever it is that they're doing on, they're not talking about the cerebellum at all. They're talking about other frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex or something like white matter. And you know, all of those, those structures are important, I get it. But nobody is talking about the cerebellum. I won't say nobody, very few people. And well, I, I missed opportunity. The, the link clinically that we see also is sometimes we see this profile that looks very much like the sensory integration at the vestibular cerebellar level. And then the kids have anxiety and they have executive functioning issues and they have difficulty with the retrieval of the motor program. And it doesn't look like they've got problems. You know, they're smart kids, but somehow that configuration of symptoms seems to kind of fit together with that, mm -hmm. with whatever the role the cerebellum seems to be playing. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm an OT, so I'm way out of my depth. Yeah, you're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've read a lot about it. Yeah, no, it's good. I think, I think part of the problem is that we don't really have a good model. I mean, I, I, I sit on these NIH study sections and frankly, when somebody, they've stopped giving me mouse models because <laughs> I don't like mice. I don't, mice are not humans, okay? I, they just aren't. And I think they're yeah. hooked up completely. And I don't want to hear about some mouse. I, you know, the only way that you can, you know, probably the closest thing is a non-human primate, uh, whether it be possible to do that. I think UC Davis has got uh, a good group of people. And then the, your, your friend up there in was it Wisconsin, I guess. Uh, whose name Mary is Schneider. Yeah, uh, there, there, there are people that are doing some non-human primate work. And mm -hmm. I think that, that would be the way to go because it, I don't know how you're going to do this too much in humans. Um, I guess you could, but it's, but it, please don't do it in a mouse. I just, I, it's, it's not going to work. It needs to be something that's closer to the human, home, human brain and to try to figure out to what the connections are and uh, where they're, where they're, not connecting the way they should, I think is would be a great study. Is, is she still doing research, Mary Schneider? Uh, she's retired, oh. so she um, she's still publishing, but she's publishing on the data that she collected. I think up until her retirement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she just not too long ago she had a publication in the uh, Child Development Journal. Uh huh. Okay on the sensory processing differences in primates. Good, okay, all right. Does she have any um, students or graduate postdocs that came after her that they're following up on any of her work? You know, I'll send you that most recent article. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I hope so. Okay, okay. I hope so. Yeah, for sure. But she's very, very good. Do you know any, work, any of the work that Ed Levin's been doing over at Duke? He, he has a, he, now that I've been maligned mice, he has a rat model. <laughs> so, so that we've, uh, I think that, I think his funding ran out. So he's doing, I think he's doing zebra fish or something at this point, but, but he was very interested in that had worked with Lucy Miller. Uh, she, he was part of her sort of think tank thingy, which is how I got to meet him. So we were doing some work on um, sensory processing in these, this rat model that he had. Uh, and we, we did publish this one, which had a lot to do with uh, acetylcholine and uh, histamine receptors, and but they were deep, deep uh, structures. There was not cerebellum involved, in, but, but well, quite honestly, we really were not looking at cerebellum. We were focusing on the limbic system and the what's called the anterior cingulate and the insula and other areas, all of which are sort of interconnected with the other structures. Um, but I, you know, and unfortunately, we ran out of money before we had the chance to proceed beyond that. Um, but I think, you know, the problem is that I think that there, there are probably a lot of different structures that are involved in sensory processing. And I, I mean, I doubt seriously that we're going to find the spot, you know. Sorry, but I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, the whole brain is involved in that. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Well, we call it sensory integration. That's the what <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> well. Are you having, um, are people... If it, are people more accepting of that term these days? I think so. Good. Okay. I think, yeah, Barry Stein uh, published an article not too long ago uh, 
kind of raising the question, like let's let's revisit this concept from a basic science point of view, saying that you know this is really a good term. This you know the 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 science is really supporting that the the simultaneous processing of multisensory data makes a difference and you can't just study unimodal stimuli and get the result that's not how yep, right. people function so it's that integrative function you know whether it's the timing of stimuli whether that's simultaneous and and being processed at the right time or the accuracy of the data coming in as you put it all together into a perceptual unit um i i think it's still from where, well, from what I think, I think it's one of the most important things we do as humans is to integrate all that information to make sense of it, to then do things. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally yeah. agree. So, yeah. good for him. We so, keep using it. <laughs> do you have a, could you send me a, a, a citation on that particular article? Yeah, I'll send you that article too. I have it, yeah. I'll send Mary's and Barry, Mary's and Barry's, yeah. <laughs> Okay. I think we have about five minutes, right? Yeah. So, Marco, is there any other main yeah, question that's coming up? Or? There's actually a question here that might be on, on the topic we were talking about. Um, so it says, Dr. Bauman, are you in support of the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics 2012 statement that pediatricians should not use sensory processing disorder there is a diagnosis instead to consider other developmental diagnosis do you think it needs to be a comorbid uh, diagnosis or uh, or no play this by me again you better sure. tell me Patrick, you know, i don't margaret you might be able to um to, do you see a little q a yeah yeah on no. your screen if I you think click if there you click on it you can see read the question no yeah. i understand i mean i'm reading the question but i'm trying to clarify this in oh. my <laughs> okay. okay so the american academy of pediatrics says that you should not use the term sensory processing disorder and that you should think about other things is that what i'm is that the interpretation? Yes. Yes. You're kidding me. <laughs> I did. That was 2012. Mm -hmm. I hope they've revised their ideas since then. I think. I huh? That, I, think, no, no. I was just saying that your reaction kind of answers the, the, <laughs> the question right away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It definitely is a term, definitely is something in my view, that's a sensory processing disorder. And I think part of the, well, it's, it's not, it's not always a bill, I don't know about you guys, but it's not always a billable diagnosis, frankly. So I, and I wish we could get that changed uh, because I think it is, it should be a billable diagnosis. So I end up often calling these kids developmental coordination disorder or whatever I can get them called so that I can get them the services. Yeah. But I, I'm not sure why people are still struggling with that because I think this, at least it got into the into the DSM five this time as at least under the autism story that they're now recognizing that sensory processing disorders are part of the autism story. So at least it got on that way. And I know that yeah. Lucy, Lucy tried Lucy Miller tried really hard to get it in there as a separate diagnosis and it didn't succeed. But I hope with the next version that that it, it will get in because I think. I, Personally, I absolutely believe it's a, it's a separate entity. Mm -hmm. I do. If that's the question. Thank you. That's the, is that the question? Mm -hmm. That was it. Yeah, I think, I, I think so. <laughs> OK. Um, well, we just have a couple minutes left. So what are you doing for fun to, to <laughs> make sure that you stay whole and healthy for this time of seclusion? You mean? For fun now, while we've got this coronavirus thing, or a fun yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my ordinary life, my, uh, ordinary, <laughs> my ordinary life, I still figure skate, and um, I have a, a coach who I want to say beats me up, but he uh, he he he's not going to let me get away with anything. So, and I really miss not doing that. Right now, we're just uh, walking. Um, cleaning house, <laughs> you, know, you know, silly things, things that I should have been dying, doing before that I'm now having time to do. And then, you know, there's a lot of online work that we're doing. So, you know, I'm still seeing patients online. You know, um, my California kids, there's, a, I, 
I was supposed to come out there on, on March, and I'm so I was vacillated about whether I was going to get on the plane and go out there, and I'm so glad that I changed my mind because I yeah. think I'll be stuck in a hotel room at this point. Um, but I, I think they're still trying to set up the the uh, the you know the the website in order to get something on for those kids. But out here, you know, we're seeing kids from the Cape. Everybody is online these days. So yeah, what are you doing? Kind of the same thing. Staying busy. <laughs> Can you walk? Getting together with our friends online when that's I can. right. Getting together with you. You're a role model, par excellence. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and it was great to see you. I, it's been an age. I don't know how long it's been since I've seen you, Joy, Zoe. So I, I know. Well, it's great to see you, and thank you again for all your contributions, well, lifelong. And you guys and have taught me a lot. You've taught yeah. me a lot, and I really have appreciated. And I always, it's fun to come out to California because then I get to hang out with Suzanne and Richard. I know we're so privileged. We have amazing friends, and to so include you as one of them, we're very privileged. Well, cheers, everybody! Cheers! Yes, thank and, you, thank you, next, you so much. Next Wednesday, you, we're going to have a whole session on telehealth. Oh, good! All right. Come can back I, next Wednesday. Can I join in? Yeah, of absolutely. Course. You're we'll always welcome anytime. Okay, you need to let <laughs> me know how I can join in, okay? All, All right. right. Okay. And we'll okay. uh, we'll send everyone the recording and we'll send those references too. That's so good. thank That's you, so Katie. Perfect. Thank you, Marco. And thank you so much, Margaret. Thanks. Stay thank well. you. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Stay bye connected. Bye. Don't forget. Yeah. <laughs> bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.